happens where many people can watch it's only for free media. There's another option is Jixi, but the quality is very bad. I was thinking that the server is on Zoom, I don't know. Yeah, actually, but yeah, there are actually guidelines, but as of now, we don't have any dependable uh, alternative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jixi is what I promote, but somehow the quality is not Okay, I think it's almost time. Yeah, oh man, uh, I'm actually going on, right? This, uh, just ask them to go, go to the site. I'm in the VC office. I'm in the VC office. Alright, we are starting now. Okay, bye. Dr. Felix, there is some disturbances of the sound actually. Good morning, sir. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Hello, Andy. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Paramjit, sir, you can start uh, an introduction first. Uh, uh, are you we are we live on uh, yes. YouTube now? Yes, we are okay. live. Okay, you can monitor how many participants and all that. Uh, yes, we yeah. can start. Okay. Can we start now? Yeah. We have 150 watch right now. Okay, sir, should we start now? Yeah, yeah, please, please start. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, I, first of all, I welcome uh, our Vice Chancellor, sir, uh, Professor R.K. Kohli, Dean Please. Student Welfare, uh, Dr. Garg, other faculty members of Botany Department, uh, Dean Academic Affairs and Dean Research, uh, who will be joining us by video call, and all the uh, students and other uh, participants in this webinar. Uh, this is a very heartening uh, for me that our university is organizing Central University of Punjab for the first time a webinar on the subject of biology in the School of Basic and Applied Sciences. And I was told it's the first such webinar in its history. And in fact, it's the sec second webinar in the history of the university, uh, which we are organizing. As all of us know, it's a very difficult times we are going through a COVID, due to COVID-19. And uh, this has in one way facilitated such programs where we, though we cannot go physically, but we can interact through these video chats and people who cannot physically come all the distance from different parts of the country or even abroad, they can be taken on board to have exchanges on these lines on different subjects. And we are very happy to also note that more than 1,000 students have uh, registered for this webinar, which will continue for six days. Uh, today is the first inauguration day, followed by a lecture. Uh, and uh, valedictory function will be held on uh, 5th of June, the day which, on which everyone in, throughout the world celebrates World Environment Day. There will be 14 lectures. And participants will include uh, from different arrays of biodiversity, right from bacteria up to highest uh, mammals, uh, different diversity fields, and different age groups of scientists from people of age of uh, 65 or above, and young scientists also who have made their mark in the different fields of science. So this will be a very interesting uh, talk as the, as the subject itself is a tangle bank uh, which which uh, which was first used the term which was first used by none other than Charles Darwin who founded the uh, evolutionary I mean theory as everyone knows uh, so we also have a group of tangled people here from different fields different uh, branches of science botanical and animal sciences and another very heartening feature is that Nias has been very supportive of this whole program and we have. Uh, uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar also joining us today. 
So this is a collaborative effort between CUPB and NIAS. So I welcome all of you and I will not be in between you and uh, all the participants and our vice chancellor sir has very kindly agreed to inaugurate this webinar. Though it is a holiday Sunday, everyone is busy, but, but this webinars give us opportunity to interact even on holidays. So uh, I hand over to now our honorable vice chancellor who have been always very supportive of such uh, scientific uh, uh, programs. I, I have never heard any any no from his mouth whenever anybody from our faculty. And our faculty has also been very supportive. And uh, when we first floated this idea, Dr. Felix has taken it forward. And uh, we have been very happy to see that it has seen the day, uh, uh, light of the day today. And uh, I will now hand over to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, to give his opening remarks and inaugurate this uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Paramjit Singh, and uh, thanks to all those who are joining at this moment in this webinar, and uh, thanks to Dr. Felix, who has taken this initiative of organizing this uh, six-day meet on a focus, uh, and the title he has given, as uh, Dr. Paramjit has shared, it is Tangled Bank. Uh, Tangled word is somewhat, which is uh, somehow how to put it, that uh, whether it is correct, it is correct when we look at the ecological perspective. And uh, when we look at the biodiversity perspective, it could be even biological bank of the earth. Anyway, uh, I welcome you all to this initiative, which is a joint initiative of NIAS. NIAS, I think students may be understanding it, faculties in science faculty that do know about it, what is NIAS, Indian uh, National Young Academy of Science. The young scientists below the age of 40 are made part of this Indian National Science Academy. So INIAS and Central University of Punjab, Bhatinda, has jointly ventured into this lecture workshop on Celebrate Biodiversity. Two of our faculty members are members of this INIAS. It is a very competitive you know, system in which to be elected in INIAS by a young scientist is really tough. So, fortunately, we have two young scientists with us, uh, uh, Dr. Felix and Patnaik from geology. They are in two years. So, the issue of this workshop, which we, which we are initiating today, uh, Sunday 31st of May, and it will culminate into the World Environment Day that happens to be 5th of June. The World Environment Day, you know, is 5th June. And the goal for this World Environment Day 2020 is time for nature. And the theme to achieve this goal is celebrate biodiversity. You know, if I, if I take you to around 50, 51 years back, for the first time in 1969, I suppose, the, in Switzerland, there was a referendum on amendments in land use. And in that referendum, Swiss People's Party with 56% votes, they won. And that was the initial step in the whole globe to think about environment. And based on their, this referendum, it was realized that it is not only in a small pocket of land on this globe. In fact, all over, if it is uh, one home, all over on this earth, there has to be some thinking about environment. And in 
uh, you know, in 1972, the Stockholm Conference that was uh, 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 on UN Conference on uh, Human Environment was organized. And there, UNEP, United Nations Environment Program, was initiated. Then, in 1982, 7282, in Nairobi Declaration, it was decided that every every tenth year, the governments of all the nations on this planet Earth should meet every ten years, after every ten years, to discuss what has been done and what where we are to go. Every tenth year, there is a World Earth Summit. And in 1992, the famous Earth Summit, Rio Summit, in which uh, Agenda 21 was discussed, and few principles and a few uh, decisions were taken. After Rio, it was in Johannesburg in 2002. And 2012, again, the world community came together at Rio, and it was Rio plus 20. So what was whatsoever were the you know discussions during Rio, there was a you know dialogue and discussion between deaf and dumb. Nobody tried to listen every bit, you know, others. So world community at large and this world environment day, mind you, is a people's movement, is a day for the people, by the people, of the people. And it was in uh, 2012, again, they came back to Rio. And uh, I do not know when, where. It is uh, in 2022. It is going to be organized. I do not know. The UNEP, based on the discussions, came up with certain environmental issues, which every country, every individual, every government has to focus on. They have given list of eight. In this list of eight, the more important, or I have each, each, each one is important, no doubt. Protection of atmosphere. And in this protection of atmosphere, it is combating global warming and pollution. And second is protecting the stratospheric ozone layer. Second issue came up is protection of land, you know, lithosphere, atmosphere, lithosphere, hydrosphere. In protection of land, lithosphere, protection of the forests and combating desertification, all those processes that lead to the formation of a desert. So this is the second. Third is in hydrosphere, protection of ocean and coastal line and protection of fresh water. This is the fourth. Then fifth is conservation of biological resources. In 2020, the UNEP is again trying to focus on biodiversity. I'll be talking, uh, you know, delivering a lecture on, I think, on 5th of June. And here I will not talk more on this. Uh, the world environment, the, the focus or the, or the goal, I am referring only to those, that goal. Then environmentally sound management of biotechnology. You know, the government at large, all the governments at large, they understand that the population is increasing and we have to meet with their requirements. So how safely we can use biological technology, use our biological organisms in technological improvement. And then management of toxic chemicals and hazardous waste is the seventh issue which is under the focus of the international governments. And of course, most important, protection of human health and quality of life. Everything, whatsoever we are doing, we are doing for this purpose of human health and improving the quality of life. The actions which the governments, they are trying to focus on, 
range from long term perspectives to the short term goals and here climate change and all these issues they are interlinked that is why if I, if uh, dr felix says it is a tangled i agree yes it is tangled next so halting climate change life on land protection of biodiversity life below see you know there is another concept which is coming up i was discussing with the ministry of environment and forest they say that diversity or life beyond boundaries you know every country has a boundary physical boundary even in the ocean there is a boundary life beyond that is also an issue which no countries as as of now trying to focus on and the more important i believe if i say which is the if somebody asks me what is the most important thing which can save our lives i would say wastage can deteriorate our life over consumption can waste our lives so fundamental two principles or both both these two principles are joined together what i believe avoiding over consumption over use second is avoiding wastage each one of us is responsible for over use and wastage if we focus if if you not tell our children or if we practice it children will automatically you know no we also all know that earth is only one planet where life exists and uh, the possibility of life on uh, uh, mars is yet to be ascertained but on earth life is there and the dimensions of this earth they are limited need for individual and number of individuals is increasing so we have to really think about it and the only solution in my opinion lies in avoiding over consumption and stopping wastage i'll not be dealing more you know i have been lecturing on these issues when we, when we look at india the resources which we have are in plenty we we feel that these are for us we are, we don't feel like leaving it for the next generation money of course every parent would like to save money for the children but we feel that money with money we can buy anything which we cannot you know the 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 current example of uh, lockdown each one of us has experienced freshness in the air you might have seen many you know uh, these uh, sms messages on whatsapp clean river flowing wildlife coming on even on the roads wildlife uh, you know must be thinking that what has happened to man <laughs> nobody is disturbing us now you know in a short span of two months we could recover the lost nature it is it is a very clear good example so as a teacher as a parent as an individual my request to each one of you whosoever is listening is try to commit not to waste energy water time or any such resource biological resource food also we should not try to waste you know on these all these days all these restaurants hotels they are closed you can imagine the amount of food we have saved i am not saying that the amount if you don't eat it gets saved no the amount which gets wasted and you are all educated you all understand what i am trying to say we need to commit that we should not be into showbiz instead we should come to realism realities and in those realities if we avoid 
such wastages it will be good for good service for nature and uh, uh, it means uh, we would be uh, serving to the cause of world environment day thank you very much dr felix is sitting close to me and i am asking that how much time is required so i'll not go into all details the only thing i'll come to it that uh, uh, this year's uh, world environment day is on celebrating biodiversity and it is in colombia the host country is colombia in support with in support from germany and i was just wondering why did they select colombia of all the areas why again the focus is in uh, south america rio de janeiro and then this uh, uh, again rio de janeiro uh, rio plus 20 and now colombia the reason is simple it is one of the 17 mega diverse regions on this planet earth 17 mega diverse india is also one of those and 10% of the species of the world are in colombia it means the whole nation is a hotspot with over 2000 species of plants and over 2000 something species of animals they are endemic only that region and this is a uh, second most diverse countries in the world next to brazil but brazil is seven times more in area than colombia it means if i if i normalize the values i was thinking of normalizing it so if we normalize the value it seems colombia is much more important small area more diversity so uh with these words i stop here and uh, wish you all good success and i believe that uh, this webinar will give us some thoughts and some actions to follow if we stop wastage of anything and everything it means we are really caring for the nature with these words thanks to you all who who are listening who are joined or who will be listening later on thanks to dr felix dr paramjit vine i think dr garg was also there in the screen and all those who have watched thank you so much good day to all Uh, thank you, oh, yes. sir. Thank you for your very valuable and uh, um, thought-provoking uh, comments, and uh, thanks for inaugurating this. Uh, and you have rightly said that uh, South America is a uh, center of uh, diversity, like India. And as you were asking about that 2022 uh, COP. of uh, biodiversity where it will be held uh, that is another interesting point central american country costa rica which is still richer in biodiversity so uh, i don't know whether by 2022 we will be able to physically meet there or whether that will also be held uh, virtually like this webinar uh, uh, but thanks again sir for giving and i i assure you that uh, we will come uh, at the end of this uh, webinar with some thoughts and some actions which uh, policy makers can make or do based on discussions and uh, our deliberations during these six six days uh, thank you sir now i will hand over to dr felix to just uh, continue with the proceedings of today's inauguration mm.
डॉक्टर फेलिक्स विल यू लाइक टू कंटिन्यू और शुड आई गिव इट टू नो डॉक्टर गर्ग डायरेक्टली फॉर सर यू कैन यू कैन कंटिन्यू सर नेक्स्ट इज प्रोफेसर गर्ग एंड देन डॉक्टर चंद्रशेखर शर्मा या डॉक्टर गर्ग प्लीज हैव योर कमेंट्स सर for two days this uh, i will hand over to dr uh, garg uh, who is the dean of student welfare uh, in uh -huh. the university thank uh, you thank you thank you professor ranjit singh a uh, very good morning to all of you first of all i welcome our honorable vice chancellor professor rk kohli professor pramjit singh professor sanjeev thakur faculty members from the department of botany and other departments of the Uh, university and other universities those are joining at the moment and to all the student on behalf of central university of punjab uh, you all know that biodiversity is one among the three major international environmental issues and uh, these issues are uh, one of them is uh, this climate change second ozone layer and third one is uh, uh, biodiversity and uh, you also know that uh, environment uh, whatever we are having today on this earth is only because of the biodiversity and we all know the importance of biodiversity we all know the losses to the biodiversity which we have done in the past and which we are doing at present uh, we all know that uh, whatever life is existing on the earth that is only because of the above ground and below ground uh, biodiversity uh, that is existing uh, on this uh, planet and uh, you all might be knowing that uh, united nations had given in 2008 uh, millennium development goals uh, in uh, they were related with the population control hunger poverty etc but uh, then the scope of these eight millennium development goals was increased and these goals were increased from 8 to 17 and these were given another name that is sustainable development goals uh, in 2015 and from 2015 to 2013 the time period has been given uh, by the united nations and if you will look on these 17 sustainable development goals you will find several of them are related with the uh, biodiversity one of them is protection or conservation or management of the diversity existing below the water another of them is the conservation of the terrestrial biodiversity and third one of them is uh, that is goal number 15 that is the protection of different kind of ecosystem and there is another very important goal that is the protection of or management of our urban environments so i hope uh, dr felix and department of biosciences have chosen a very good topic and some speaker may be talking about these uh, sustainable development goal i hope so and as far as uh, biosciences in central university of punjab are concerned we have a very strong faculty and very strong you can say uh, basket of departments in the central university of punjab we have five six uh, departments which are working in the field of uh, biosciences we have uh, department of botany department of zoology then we have biochemistry microbiology environmental sciences and in all these departments we uh, the faculty members as well as our research scholars and pdfs are working in the different fields of uh, biodiversity conservation biodiversity use uh, biodiversity prospecting etc under the able leadership of our honorable uh, vice chancellor who himself is a world renowned known ecologist and presently one big project uh, sanctioned by the ministry of environment uh, and forest on the invasive alien species Uh, in the himalayan uh, states of india is going on under his able leadership so i hope that in this 5 uh, days time all those who so ever are attending this seminar certainly they will get some uh, food for their brain to ponder in the coming days and i again congratulate the department of botany dr felix uh, hod professor paramjit uh, for uh, organizing this webinar and i pray to the almighty for the success of this uh, webinar have a nice day thank you over to professor paramjit thank you uh, professor garg for your elucidating opening remarks uh, on today's 
uh, this this six days uh, webinar. Uh, now I will request uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar to just give his remarks on this webinar. Dr. Chandrasekhar, please. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Paranjit, and uh, thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Kohli, for wonderful remarks. Uh, so good morning, everyone, on behalf of uh, Indian National Young Academy of Sciences, NYAS. And uh, let me first congratulate Dr. Felix and Dr. Paramjit for uh, coordinating this wonderful webinar series uh, named as Tangled Wenk, which itself is so uh, a wonderful uh, name. And this webinar uh, is on biodiversity and is jointly being organized with Central Punjab University, Patinda and NYAS. As I can see from the list of topics, there are so diversified and exciting topics uh, to be covered in this webinar series, like dogs in urban ecology, snakes, frogs, mangroves, uh, Indian songbirds, endemic fishes in Western Ghats, bacterial and biodiversity. So I'm also delighted that these topics are being covered by excellent researchers and scientists who are pioneers in their area. Some of them are INEAS members also. I thank all the speakers for their valuable time and efforts uh, for this webinar series. I'm also proud of uh, Indian National Young Academy of Sciences who quickly adapted to this rapidly evolving situation in this present lockdown and current pandemic situation and continued its efforts uh, towards science education and outreach. In fact, uh, this uh, current COVID-19 uh, provided an opportunity to connect worldwide in this non-contact mode as never before. As the topic of this uh, webinar series is on uh, biodiversity and well, I'm not uh, the expert, but uh, what I little know about biodiversity, it refers to all the variety of the life that can be found on the earth in terms of plants, animals, fungi, microorganisms, and as well as to the communities that they form, and also the habitat in which they live. Uh, this biodiversity, it's uh, basically diversity within the species, between the species, and between the ecosystem. And I'm sure that this series of lectures will provide much more insight on these issues. And I wish all the participants an excellent time and interactive session with the speakers. Hope these lectures will be available on the YouTube uh, later for wider outreach. Uh, for, and uh, with this, I will not take much time uh, because our first speaker is waiting. And I'm sure all the viewers will be eagerly waiting for listening her talk. So with this, I again uh, congratulate Central University of Punjab uh, for coordinating such a nice webinar with so diverse topics. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chandra, and uh, for giving such uh, wonderful remarks. And uh, we hope uh, that our, our collaboration, our uh, coordination uh, with the University of uh, Punjab as well as INIAS will continue in future also. And we will have uh, much more fruitful and uh, engrossing sessions uh, uh, on webinar at least uh, in future also. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Chandra. Now I will uh, invite our today's first speaker, uh, Dr. Deepa, uh, who is online already, I think. Uh, Deepa, are you, are you online? Yes, I'm here. Uh, Deepa, she has done, uh, I mean, um, I mean she, her uh, subject of uh, today's first talk is uh, in the letter of uh, evolution, we say bacteria are one of the, I mean, most primitive forms, but they, like other microbes, they are the one who are ruling the world at the moment. Though they are unseen, she will be talking about the bacterial diversity. And she got her graduation, if I'm not wrong, graduation of, uh, uh, from Pune. And she had got her higher education in Harvard and other institutions. And she has got a very good exposure. She has recently worked on uh, floor, uh, uh, those beetles uh, also, if I'm not wrong. And uh, we look forward to your uh, interesting talk on bacterial diversity. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Agassi. Thank you. 
All right. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to begin by uh, thanking um, Felix for inviting me to this uh, to give a talk here in this really interesting webinar. And I hope that, um, as earlier uh, people have said, that uh, it's an interactive session. So please do uh, ask questions and ask lots of questions and ask tough questions. It will be it will be fun to sort of really have a good discussion at the end. So I'm going to share my screen now. I have a small PowerPoint that I'd like to uh, use to as I go along uh, and, and discuss. Um, as I understand, uh, the people who are listening to this um, listening to this uh, webinar are largely masters and uh, uh, bachelor's students and some PhD students as well. So hopefully it is something that is uh, interesting uh, and exciting for everybody who's listening here. Can everybody hear me clearly and see my screen? Um, yes, Deepa, yes, perfect. Yes, Please okay. go ahead. Right. Great, yeah, one second. Um, I think I should stop my video because... Okay. All right, so let's get started then. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is bacterial diversity, as I mentioned, uh, and I am a faculty at the National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore. Um, let's get going. So what am I showing you here? Right. So this is um, a, a really, really beautiful uh, artistic image of a bacterial phylogeny, uh, which I saw at the Microbia Museum in Amsterdam a couple of years ago when I was there for a conference. And it is just this really, really beautiful museum dedicated to microorganisms. And I want to start with this picture because it's just so stunning. So when you first enter this museum, you go up in this elevator, which is very dark. And then as you step out of the elevator, there's darkness around you. And then this sort of neon lit phylogeny jumps out on this huge wall uh, as, you, as you enter the museum, right? So it's just really, really beautiful. And it, um, and it really shows this enormous diversity of organisms that, that we know of uh, where microbes are sort of playing a prominent role um, in this for this museum, of course. And so I just want to highlight um, that the, the part on the left that you see there is bacteria. I hope you can see the small um, label there on the top. Uh, you next have archaea, which is a, a, another domain of life. And then finally, eukarya, which includes uh, humans um, at the very bottom right corner, of course. So you can appreciate the sort of large diversity of organisms that, that we have in, in, in the tree of life. And for those of you who are not familiar with the phylogeny, let me just quickly uh, run you through it because it will be something that I will return to again and again during this talk. So as you see, the, the branches of this tree uh, have these small tips and each tip typically in a phylogeny represents uh, a particular taxon, a group, a species, a population, depending on what you're, you're studying. And effectively, a phylogeny is a tree-like representation of the evolutionary relationships between different uh, groups of organisms, right? So every tip here could be a species, for example. And as you trace back from the tips of these branches towards the root of the tree, you will be tracing the evolutionary ancestry of each of these groups of organisms. So all these organisms that have branched, that share a common branch in a recent time period um, will have a recent shared common ancestor, which is that node that, that forms at each cluster or that you see on this tree. And as you go farther back in time, these, uh, these branches and these nodes themselves then converge into the most recent universal bacterial common ancestor, right? Which is at the, at the root of this uh, clade of bacteria. So, so phylogenies are a very, very useful and important tool for us to understand evolutionary processes. And we use them quite a lot. Um, we as in researchers in evolutionary biology in general use phylogenies a lot to be able to understand how organisms have evolved and how their characteristics and traits have changed uh, during evolutionary time. And remember this evolutionary time can span anything from a few thousands of years in which you can construct a phylogeny all the way to millions of years, right? So our most recent common ancestor with the bacteria or the archaea or the eukarya is millions of years old. Uh, and so we can make inferences about these organisms that no longer exist, but that existed long, long ago using what we understand about current bacteria or, or taxa that we see around. 
Okay, so now I'm going to ignore these archaea and eukarya parts of this tree because other people are going to talk about them later on and focus on bacteria a little bit. Right? So I'd like to start off by sort of reminding everybody that, you know, all bacteria are not spheres or rods. When we think of bacteria and some of the first Google images, if you search for, for bacteria, um, they're sort of nice balloons or they are rods. And, and of course, many bacteria are shaped like this. But there's actually a lot more diversity in terms of bacterial shape than we are able to appreciate. And here is an example from a very nice recent paper, which examined on a phylogeny of bacteria, how has bacterial morphology changed, right? So just based on these cartoon pictures that you see at the periphery of this uh, phylogeny, you can appreciate there are many, many different forms of bacteria. Some are uh, tiny wriggles, there are squiggles, there are spirals, there are helices, there are appendaged forms, there are vibrioid or curved forms, some have branches, some have multicellular filaments also, and these are all bacteria, right? And so this bacterial kingdom itself is so huge. Yeah, it's, it's really enormous. And there's so much diversity that's packed into this one group. Um, it's, it's really quite staggering. And so I really like this paper because it, it really highlights the diversity of bacterial shapes and forms that are known to exist already. And there are many, of course, about which we don't have this information. We don't know how, what many bacteria look like at all, what their cells look like, because we've not been able to observe them under the microscope yet. But these are the bacteria that we know of, and they're incredibly diverse, right? And so you can see, for example, that the, the ones that are highlighted, the species that are highlighted in blue are appendage forms. The ones that are helical are in green. And you can see that many of these seem to appear towards the tips of these uh, branches in the phylogeny, suggesting that they might be derived or more recently evolved forms, right? Whereas more ancient forms might tend to be more simpler and more like rods or spheres and so on, right? So there's a lot more that we need to understand and investigate um, about bacterial shape and morphology. And of course, there are um, a lot of labs in the world that are actually investigating specific kinds of structures and specific kinds of bacteria and what governs the shape and the size of bacteria. But we need to know a lot more and to explore this diversity a lot better. I want to move on now to talking a little bit about where do bacteria live? So. Um, I think most of you know in general, the simplest answer is they're kind of everywhere, right? And part of the reason why they're everywhere is they play really big major ecological roles in the environment. And I'll just go through these quickly just to remind you that without bacteria, it would be very hard to decompose things and to cycle nutrients in, the, in, in our um, ecosystem, right? So bacteria are going to degrade a lot of organic matter they are going to release a lot of compounds either in the air or in the, or in the soil or in the water, which will then get cycled through, which are available for plants and animals to use. Bacteria also have a major ecological role in terms of mutualisms with animals and plants. And this is something that we have, uh, the breadth of this we have really only recently discovered in the last couple of decades, where it seems like gut bacteria, for example, are very, very ubiquitous across animals and plants, and they seem to play really major roles in, in helping these plants or animals uh, to survive or to grow fast or to kill their enemies and so on. And we'll come to some examples of these later. Bacteria also, of course, are parasites of pathogens. You've heard of Clostridium which, uh, and Salmonella, which cause food poisoning because of the toxins that they produce. And these toxins are produced so that they are better able to uh, in, you know, in, uh, invade their hosts. And because of all of these different features of different bacteria, we can use them and harness bacteria for our own purposes, for human use. And these can be ranging from bioremediation, which means that you're fixing the mess that we make by releasing toxins into the environment at mining sites or due to oil spills or other disasters that happen in the environment. We can also use bacteria to uh, produce fuel for us. So many of you may have heard that, um, that biofuel can be produced using some kinds of bacteria and so on. So, so this is sort of just a broad outline of what roles bacteria can play. And partly because of this, they really occupy this really 
amazing cluster of diversity. And so this um, is a image from, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to add the citation to this paper, a paper that looked at uh, based on uh, sequencing the 16S ribosomal RNA gene of a number of different bacteria found across different studies where people sample different kinds of environments like vertebrate guts or seawater or soil. And they asked what bacteria are found there. And they connected each dot, which represents one bacterial type with lines that show how commonly uh, are these bacteria found in different samples from a particular location or a particular animal at a particular patch. Right? And you see that seawater, for example, in purple has a very different set of bacteria that are found in seawater versus soil versus guts of vertebrates. And I like this image because it sort of really shows uh, how there's this almost 3D world of bacterial networks and bacterial um, relationships and, and, and diversity that is mapping into the world that we see every day, which is, you know, water and soil and, and animals and so on. Okay, so now I want to talk quickly about um, distribution of oceans uh, of prokaryotes, which includes both bacteria and archaea in the oceans of the world. And this is a, a relatively new project that was started a few years ago uh, called the Tara Ocean Sampling Project. And their goal was to ask, well, what are the microbes that are living in the different uh, oceans of the world? And so they had this huge expedition where ships went out and sampled water from different depths. And you can see the sampling locations in this map here. And they pulled out these water samples from different depths and measured or asked how many bacterial and other species are we finding at different depths. And so the data presented in this particular paper are from uh, combining archaea and bacteria. So it's prokaryotes together. And I find this very interesting, which is why I want to spend some time on it. So in this new plot, you see that um, on the y-axis, there is species richness, which is simply counting how many types of uh, species do we find in a particular sample of water. Uh, on the next panel, you see beta diversity. And again, that measures how many species, the species composition that you find in a particular location, how much, how different is it from the species composition in the next location that you sampled from, right? So it's basically asking, is there a lot of variation from spot to spot in how much, how many species and which, how many of which kind of species you find, or is it largely similar? And the third panel shows you cell density, which is the number of cells found per unit water sampled, right? And the three uh, categories on the x-axis are showing you surface water in red, which is at the top of the ocean, um, deep chlorophyll maximum, and then mesopelagic zone, which is the deepest water area that they sampled with blue. And I think some really interesting trends come up from here. First, and perhaps this is not particularly surprising, is cell density on the right side is reducing as you go deeper and deeper, right, in the ocean. So there are many more cells of any species in, um, in the surface waters where you have sunlight, of course, and so because a lot of bacteria living in the oceans can photosynthesize, they are uh, able to grow really, really well. And as you go deeper in the waters, um, there is fewer, there are fewer species that are, um, and so fewer cells that are able to grow very well. Of course, temperature changes, nutrient availability changes. So many different things change as you go deeper. You find also in the leftmost plot that the species richness, that is the number of species that you find in a particular sample, is increasing as you go at deeper uh, depths, uh, at higher depths in the ocean, right? And this is also interesting because if you now compare the first and the third plots, something is striking. And that is that in the surface waters, you find there are very few rare species. Sorry, <laughs> there are a few species which are very abundant, right? So there are fewer species in the surface waters, but the cell density is high. Whereas in the deeper ocean waters in the blue bars, you see that there are many more species, but probably each of them is relatively rare. And that's a very, very interesting distribution, which is um, also found some of these same patterns are found in other or organisms in the world as well. And I'm sure you'll hear about this in the other talks in this webinar. So they also looked at temperature gradients. So as you might imagine, as temperature changes, maybe the number of species 
uh, of that of prokaryotes also changes and indeed you find that to be the case as the water temperature increases along the x-axis in this plot you find that in general there is higher richness so there are more kinds of bacterial and archaeal species and this is true both in the northern hemisphere as well as in the southern hemisphere and this intermediate optimum though so around 15 degrees celsius or between this 10 to 20 degrees Celsius region where you find the maximum richness or maximum number of species is very, very similar to the pattern that is observed for animals and plants, uh, terrestrial animals and plants, where uh, very often at intermediate temperatures, you find that diversity peaks. And finally, uh, if you look at the red versus blue coloring of these, of these uh, data points, you find that at the equator, you have, again, uh, relatively higher richness, but in the case of water prokaryotes, it's not the highest richness, right? So the equatorial regions tend to have higher richness compared to towards the poles, which are in blue uh, on the earth, but it's not a monotonic relationship, right? So there are very, very interesting patterns, some of which mirror what we know for plants and animals on the land, um, and some of which, which are different from uh, other organisms that we've studied much more exhaustively in ecology and evolution. And so these are grounds to sort of say, well, we need much more work to understand bacterial diversity and distribution in the, in the different habitats that we observe in the world. All right, and I want to talk just briefly about how our own bodies are also enormous ecosystems for bacteria to colonize, right? So I'm sure that many of you have heard, um, an average human has more than 10,000 types of bacteria in, in our, in our bodies which occupy and colonize our bodies. And so we're kind of walking bags of, of bacteria really. And it's estimated that about one and a half kg of our body weight is, is actually bacterial cells. And there are an equal number of bacterial as well as uh, our own human cells in our bodies. And finally, the number of cells that we poop out in feces are also equally divided between bacterial cells and human cells, right? So, so basically, we also, our bodies also represent a really, really rich ecosystem for bacteria to colonize. And I will uh, talk a little bit more about this later. So let's get back to broad overviews of what bacteria do. So what do bacteria eat? Um, we know that bacterial metabolism is very, very diverse. And I'm sure some of you have seen these in textbooks before. You have bacteria that are phototrophs versus chemotrophs. So they can use energy, uh, they can acquire energy from light or they can acquire it from chemicals which they, um, which they absorb. Uh, you have heterotrophs or autotrophs, so those that produce their own energy versus those that acquire energy from consuming others. You have aerobic or anaerobic bacteria. You have those that fix nitrogen, and you have some that show metabolic cooperation. For example, what you see in biofilms, right? These slimy, sticky things that form on water pipes or in your or kitchen sink if you don't clean it um, usually regularly and so on. So bacterial metabolism also is very, very diverse. And that's and this is just a snapshot of the kinds of diversity that you see. And it's partly because they're able to metabolize so many different things that they're able to occupy um, so many different niches in the, in the ecosystem. So finally, I'll, I'll come to my most favorite topic, which is how do bacteria evolve? And of course, it's a very broad and very general question. I want to give you a glimpse of a few things that we know. So here's one story of bacterial genome evolution, which I, I find super fascinating. So this is this picture that you see here in the corner is a mealybug. It's an insect. It's a pest very often of many crop plants as well. And there are many species of mealybugs, of course. Um, this particular species, uh, people have been studying bacteria that live inside this mealybug. Right? And there's a really fascinating Russian doll uh, kind of situation happening here. So what you see in the picture below are cells of the mealybug, which have been stained in different colors. In blue, you find the mealybug's own cells, right? the nucleus of these mealybugs, which has been stained in blue. So if you imagine each blue and then sort of this boundary of the cell, which is a bit farther away from that blue. In red, you see marked bacteria called tremblia, which is one of these bacterial endosymbionts. So they're engulfed by the host cell and they live inside the host cell, right? So you see that the red bacteria tremblia are occupying a very large fraction of the total cell volume of each of the mealybug cells, right? 
And in green, you have another bacterial species called Moronella. And Moronella is nested inside the red bacterium, Tremblaya, right? So there's a very interesting trap, tripartite nested relationship here, where one bacterium, the green one, lives inside another bacterium, the red one, and the red one lives inside a mealybug cell, right? And what are they doing there, of course, right? That's the question. And again, there's a lot of research that has happened um, on the system. And what people have found is that uh, they have partitioned the job of metabolizing different kinds of compounds and producing different kinds of vitamins and amino acids that are required by the host cell. So the green bacterium, Moronella, does some of the job. The red bacterium, Tremblaya, does some of the job, some of the reactions. And um, the cell, the host cell itself, provides some other components of this reaction that may be required. So it's a really, really fascinating uh, story. And another very interesting component of the story is as follows. So if you imagine these circles represent the average bacterial genome, there's some variation, right? The yellow one is a little bit larger than the purple one and so on. Endosymbion genomes, such as those of this green and red, Tremblaya and Bornella bacteria, tend to be much smaller in size. And this is a trend that people have observed in many, many bacteria which live inside uh, other animal and uh, plant cells, right? That they, they just have these tiny shrunken genomes. And what people have found is that in this particular case, the mealybug genome, which is shown here in this big blue circle, has acquired genes from old bacterial associates that the, that the mealybug used to, uh, used to host in its cells, right? So some of the genes have been transferred from the bacterial genome to the mealybug genome. And these genes can now substitute and make and provide the role and provide the functions that are lost in these endosymbionts, the, the blue and the green ones, sorry, the green and the red ones, which keep losing gene, genes as they evolve along with this insect partner, right? So there's a very complex dynamic going on in the genomes of these different species. So there's a lot of gene exchange, both between bacterial species as well as between uh, host and bacterial genomes. And it's really, really fascinating. It's like archaeology almost. You're digging up the past by figuring out what genes existed, when did they exist, when were they lost, when were they gained, and what functions do they perform now, right? So, so this is a very interesting and very rich system where a lot of work has happened. And in general, if you zoom out a little bit, insects um, in insects, bacteria play a lot of different uh, symbiosis roles. And I just want to give you a flavor of what kinds of roles we know they play in insects. Uh, so on, on, in this figure, you see that on the left, in some aphids or crickets, they uh, defend against parasitoids. These are wasps, uh, typically, which will come and lay eggs in the eggs or larvae of these insects. And um, the, the host insect has to defend itself uh, from those parasitoid uh, larvae that are developing inside. And they will use these bacterial symbionts to produce toxins or um, otherwise kill the wasps, uh, eggs, and larvae. They also affect host plant use in aphids. They affect color or heat tolerance. So uh, in, in one species of aphids, for example, uh, the, the symbionts, uh, actually this, those were not bacteria, those were fungi, I think. Um, but, but the heat tolerance uh, is definitely mediated by some bacteria, which are endosymbionts in some of these aphids. In some cases, in its earwig, which is what you see in the in panel B, they help defend against spider predators. You find, actually, that's not an earwig, maybe. Sorry, I'm not sure what, what insect that is. Um, in Drosophila flies and panel C, you see, you know, we know that diet or mate choice, as well as defending against viruses, is mediated by endosymbionts. Um, there's an endosymbiont called Wolbachia, which does really, really fascinating um, uh, stuff with insects. It controls their sex ratio sometimes and controls their reproduction. So in many populations of some species, you find that um, you only have mostly females that you find uh, of the insect and no males are to be found. And that's in some cases because this Wolbachia endosymbiont kills the male embryos or converts them into female embryos. And finally, the embryo sex development, as you see in the last image for a butterfly that has been well studied, is also affected by an endosymbiont, right? So there are really diverse roles that uh, insect symbionts play in, in for their hosts. And that is another subject for uh, study, which is fascinating. And I want to 
um, show you a phylogeny, sort of asking, okay, on the broader scheme of things, how often are bacteria free living versus mutualists versus parasites? And, and how, how do these transitions happen? Right? So here's a, a, a short sort of shorter version of a phylogeny of bacteria where they've mapped out known uh, mutualist bacteria or known parasitic bacteria in, in green and in red. And the free living ones are shown in black. And you see that there are actually many, many transitions to either a parasitic or a free living or a mutualist lifestyle that have occurred in this phylogeny. But typically, the trend seems to be that you go from being a free living bacterium, which is shown in black, to a parasitic. And sometimes the parasitic becomes mutualist, or sometimes the mutualist becomes a parasite. Right? So there's, again, a lot of research going on in this area to ask, well, how often do these transitions occur? Are they one way? Are they evolutionary dead ends? Do they cycle back ever? And this is something that people are trying to understand a lot. And finally, I'll end the session, I think, by talking about bacterial evolution in the laboratory, which my lab does a, a lot of. And um, just as an example, to understand evolutionary processes, bacteria are really useful because many of them grow really fast in the lab. So on the left here, you see a cartoon image of uh, how we do these experimental evolution protocols. Usually, we can take bacteria which are sick and in a particular environment, and we force them to adapt to the environment over time by serially transferring them in the same environment. And then after some uh, many generations of evolution, we might find that the bacterium has adapted, it's a little bit happier, able to survive. And then we can ask, well, how has it managed to do this, right? So I'm showing you here a plot on the right from a very famous experiment set up by Richard Lenski. Um, he works in the US and he set up in the 80s this really long-term experiment where he took replicate populations of E. coli, your standard uh, workhorse in the laboratory, and uh, set up um, 12 different populations, each of which was allowed to uh, be serially transferred like you see in the cartoon on the left, and was allowed to adapt and evolve in a uh, carbon limited or relatively carbon limited medium. Right? So he just had minimal medium with glucose for those of you who are bacterial um, are microbiologists. And you see that he's continued this experiment for many years now. I mean, it's still going on. And maybe there was a brief pause, I think, for COVID, uh, but then they seem to have restarted their experiments again. And so by now, actually, they are, I think, up to 70,000 generations. Well, that's a lot. And so we can learn a lot. This is the longest running bacterial experiment, as far as I know, uh, a man-made experiment. And what you see is if you measure relative fitness on the y-axis, uh, so fitness in, in, in general is a term used to, uh, to measure how well is an organism going to do compared to other organisms, right? So there are many components of fitness one can measure. The simplest one that people use a lot in bacterial work is growth rate. You can also measure competitive fitness. So you can compete two kinds of bacteria against each other and ask which one does better than the other, right? Um, so in this case, I think they measured... Um, competitive fitness, but also growth rate. And you find that the bacteria are basically getting better and better at growing in this environment over time. And that's kind of not surprising because you do expect that evolution is going to result in better adaptation to one's environment over time. And the rate at which this happens seems to slow down over time, right? And there's a really fascinating uh, aspect of this where in some of these lineages, which were evolving, remember I said there were 12 different replicates, some of them acquired mutations which increase their mutation rate, right? And those are marked in green. They're called hypermutators. So the mutation rate, the rate at which they're accumulating new genetic variation has increased in these lineages. And you can see clearly as a result of that, because there is more genetic variation entering the population, there is more beneficial mutations that can be sampled. And these hypermutators therefore adapt at a much faster rate compared to the ancestors. Right? And so there's, again, fascinating work that has gone on from this experiment, many, many things that we've learned. And so these kinds of laboratory experimental evolution uh, sort of protocols are very, very useful and important for us to learn general things about how evolution works and how ecology works. So I'm going to end my talk by highlighting a few open questions that I find fascinating. There are many more, of, many more questions, of course, that you could ask. But these are things that I'm interested in. How are bacteria distributed across different spatial scales? So we know 
relatively more about bacteria in the laboratory or some kinds of bacteria in the laboratory. We don't understand very much about if we go out and sample soil or sample waters, how are bacteria distributed across different spatial scales? And part of the reason this is this question remains an open question in a general sense is it's hard to do this kind of work, right? Because there are so many kinds of bacteria in the, in the natural environment and they keep changing, it seems, and it's hard to sample from nature. It's hard to also measure how many of who is there. And so these are all challenges that are becoming less and less severe in the last few years. And so with new sequencing technology, new single cell methods, we can actually do a lot. And so these are questions that I think are within our grasp in the next few years. And I wish more people studied the distribution of bacteria in nature. What ecological and evolutionary processes govern these distributions? So how do these distributions arise? Are they very different from what we know for plants and animals? Are they very patchy? Do they keep shifting? Uh, or are they sort of very, very panmictic? Um, what, what, what is happening? And so in our lab, we've been trying to understand this to some extent. We've, we've done some projects to understand uh, how bacteria living on uh, plant leaves are distributed, so specifically rice plants in the northeast parts of India, where there's you know, many different uh, varieties of rice that are grown locally that have been traditionally cultivated for many, many generations. And we've asked whether these different rice varieties uh, are associated with different kinds of bacteria on their leaves. And do, do these bacteria offer any benefits to the rice plants? Could they potentially be used in future for increasing yields of these very, very interesting and really tasty local varieties of rice, which are disappearing because unfortunately their the yield is not so high, right? So they're not very uh, commercially viable for farmers. So we're hoping that through some of this research that we're doing, we might be able to help farmers say, okay, well, maybe this one particular bacterium is going to perhaps increase the yield or uh, help increase the yield of a particular rice variety. So we're not there yet. It's very early days in this research but we're hoping to understand this better. We also want to know how do other species impact bacterial distribution and evolution, right? So I just mentioned that so many of these bacteria associate with insects or other hosts, including humans, and we don't really understand very well how these associations affect where these bacteria live and how they evolve. In some cases, like the mealybug situation that I explained to you earlier, we know a lot about right but for most other cases we really don't know much so again people in my lab are trying to understand this we are trying to understand this using this insect system called flower beetle which is a pest of different kinds of grain in in, in india as well as uh, worldwide actually and we want to use that system as an example to ask uh, well by the way it, it also depends on this bacteria that much we figured out by now so if you remove the bacteria in the flower uh, that this uh, atta that this beetle is living in, um, the beetle doesn't do as well, right? So it doesn't grow as well, it doesn't survive as well. And so we're using that system now to try and figure out how bacteria in uh, living with the beetle are evolving as the as a fact, you know, as a result of being associated with the beetle. And finally, what are the mechanisms through which bacteria interact with other species? So this is something else that we want to understand. Again, this is not really a completely open question because we do know a lot about how bacteria, for example, interact with plants. So bacteria that are pathogens, we understand quite a lot about. There are many uh, pathogens of plants and animals which we do understand fairly well. Why the bacteria, uh, sorry, how are the bacteria producing toxins that they produce? How do they manipulate the host into you know, helping them? But we don't understand that as well or as much for symbiotic species or facultative symbionts, which are not obligate symbionts like the mealybug situation, but they're not living inside the cell. And so it's not uh, obvious that, you know, they, they, they have a, a set, a few mechanisms to deal with the host. But in, in bacteria, for example, some of them that live in our guts, some of them are not really obligate uh, mutualists with our bodies. They are, um, they're facultative. That means they can sometimes uh, be in a relationship with hosts, but sometimes they may not be in a relationship. And so we would really like to understand how these kinds of uh, relationships are maintained and how they're established. Okay, and then finally, I'll end by saying that um, if you'd like to know more about our lab, please do look up our website, which uh, gives a few more details of the projects that we're doing, has links to PDFs of papers that we've been publishing to that describe the work that we do. 
and I'll be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Deepa. Wonderful presentation, and it's a privilege to be with you here today. Thank you. So I will let me tell you something about Deepa for the for the benefit of the uh, you know the honor uh, the viewers of this program. Deepa is a PhD from University of Texas and a postdoc at Harvard for many years, and she's now working at NCBS, uh, NCBS in Bangalore. And I congratulate Deepa because she has recently been elected as a vice president of the prestigious American Society of the Naturalist. And it's also, um, we are privileged to have you here because this year's national theme of the Science Day is uh, women in science. So a women scientist, inspiring women scientist opening our entire uh, six days program is really privileged. Thank you so much for that. Uh, sir, uh, VC sir, would you like to add some points? Would you like to ask some questions? Sir, uh, Unmute, please. Okay. Yeah, congratulations, uh, Dr. Deepa. It was a very nice talk. Sorry, I can't and hear you very clearly. Um, hello. Hello. Am I audible now? Yes. Am I audible now? Yes, yeah. So oh, congratulations, it was a very nice, good talk. Thank you. The questions you raised are really appreciable. I appreciate these questions. There's a lot, one, uh, lot to be done in uh, microbial uh, biology, bacteria or viruses, etc. Mm -hmm. I was wondering that uh, there is a variety of uh, bacteria mm -hmm. all around in nature in different niches. May it be human gut, may it be deep in the ocean, Mm -hmm. or surface, or soil. And this variety of bacteria is, have, has anybody tried to study the associations and dissociations of these types? Because in case we understand the type of dissociations, these can be very useful in preventing diseases and in biocontrol of pathogens. I, I don't think there is any such study that uh, gives us uh, insight into the level of uh, association and dissociations between these bacteria in different niches. You mean across the different bacteria? How do they interact amongst each other? Uh, see, not only, you know, some bacteria, if A is available, B will also be there. Mm -hmm. If A is available, C cannot be there. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, so actually, we in ant ecology. Right, right. Of course. So that is actually done um, in in specific uh, kinds of ecosystems and specific kinds of microbial communities. That is getting better and better understood now. So, for instance, particularly for microbial communities associated with hosts, we know quite a lot from the CNS metagenome sequencing, for example, to know you know in different kinds of organisms which bacteria are present and so from those there are some general patterns that have emerged but to be able to do the kinds of functional assays that that you know of course in plant and animals uh, people do quite regularly in plant ecology um, those are a little bit still harder to do because many of these bacteria we can't actually cultivate right so to be able to experimentally show that if you have a and b then they exclude c it's a bit harder uh, people have taken the other approach in bacteria where people have constituted communities using bacteria that they can culture and ask now can we come up with general rules of who can be cultivated with whom and who excludes whom or who competes with whom and there are some um, more recent studies that have actually started to address this even using bacteria found in natural ecosystems but but you're right that there aren't as many studies um, about this as uh, as sort of commonly done in, in plant and animal ecology so I think it's largely the challenges of being able to culture different bacteria at the same time. Um, but, but we know a lot more about this now than we did even 10 years ago. And so I, I think we'll be there soon. Uh, Deepa, so if I say you, tangled bang, what is actually coming to your mind? Is it bacteria coming amongst bacteria or bacteria with the host or the community or like a niche? What image is coming to your mind? If yeah, I so actually, if I think of Tangle Bank, you know, I, I typically think of something like a mangrove uh, area, uh, you know, with these roots that are deeply embedded um, in this in this mud and muck. And there is a lot of water coming and going, and there's all kinds of organisms that are being transported 
you know, by these abiotic conditions um, and, and very, very interesting interactions uh, across different scales of organization and different sizes. So, so yeah, it's, it's a lot of stuff that's happening. So, yeah. All right. So one of the questions that we are getting through the, you know, our uh, participant is that uh, is the novel coronavirus because you are a microbiologist. This novel coronavirus. Do you think novel coronavirus is lab made? That is man made. Everybody wants um, to know that. What is what yeah. is your opinion about it? Um, no. So there is no evidence suggesting that it is lab made or man made. And people have, of course, suggested that. Well, but you know, it looks a lot like uh, some other somebody. I think there was some. Uh, news going around that maybe parts of the genome of this virus are very similar to the HIV genome and so on. And those are simply not true. So when people have compared properly the genomes of the, this novel coronavirus versus other uh, genomes of viruses uh, isolated from bats or other animals or other known uh, viral pathogens, um, there is really no more similarity than what you would expect by simple processes of natural selection and evolution. And so um, there is simply no evidence to support the idea that this was a man-made virus. Um, as to the idea that it has leaked yeah, from, yeah, um, I think there's some feedback, sorry about that. Um, as to the idea that it has been leaked from a lab in China, again, we don't really have any evidence for that. Uh, the genomes that were sequenced from the Chinese labs that were studying uh, these related bat viruses, uh, those seem to have quite different genomes uh, from the new coronavirus. And so I think everything we see about this virus can really be explained by known simple evolutionary processes that we know occur in, in nature. So there's no reason to, to have conspiracy theories about this. Uh, Professor Paranjit Singh, would you like to add some points? Can you mute your uh, mic? Because I think are, your mic is creating some disturbance. Please. Uh, Felix, your mic is... Yeah, no, it's okay. Can you hear me, Deepa? Uh, Deepa, I, uh, congratulations for such a wonderful... Uh, uh, ex uh, you are a wonderful speaker and exponent of uh, how phylogeny work. And it was really delightful to listen to you. Uh, being a taxonomist, basically a taxonomist, my fundamental question is, as, as we know, in 1970, when uh, bacterial code was first time mentioned that this is a, these are the names of uh, bacteria which are standardized, about mm -hmm. 1,700 spe uh, 1, species were there at that time, in 1970s. Mm -hmm. So what is your estimate of global number of uh, bacteria which are there? Mm -hmm. your estimate and how many have been identified because i remember in 2007 uh, we started a new uh, new uh, uh, sort of a um, uh, annual uh, document where we documented all the species which were being published from our country and mm -hmm. i was astonished to see every year our our scientists are publishing around 100 120 uh, new bacteria from our our own uh, material in our mm -hmm. country i know same same thing is happening in throughout the world. But yeah. how many of them are similar? I mean, uh, we cannot morphologically see or compare them. Only way is to go genetically and uh, uh, chemically to know right. which one is right. the, So what is your take on this? Right. And my second part, um, of course, uh, second question is about uh, health issue. You see, I was seeing World Health Organization's recent one, one of the report which say uh, this tuberculosis is the main, uh, you see, disease, though we are talking about so many viruses Mm -hmm. which are more fatal and they cause more. But this is with us for so many years, decades mm -hmm. or even centuries. And we have not been able to overcome this bacterial disease. What is the, what's the reason or what's the reason or the secret of success of this bacterium mm -hmm. uh, against human race? Mm -hmm. I mean, why we have not been able to succeed in creating some wonder drug for this, this uh, disease, which is killing uh, hundreds of people in our country and thousands uh, throughout the world. Yeah, yeah. Please. Um, yeah, so let me take the first question first. So this, the, the idea of actually bacterial species is a bit fraught, right? It's, it's a bit problematic because, um, well, various reasons. One reason is that um, bacteria 
typically the generation time is fast and they accumulate mutations a lot. And that means that it becomes very hard to say that this E. coli is different from that E. coli, right? Because in many ways, many functional traits that we might use to identify a species, they may be identical, but they may be different in a few key traits, which allow, for example, one strain of E. coli to be able to infect an organism, a host, and another not to do so, right? So one E. coli is pathogenic, another E. coli strain is not pathogenic and so on. And so I think this is the fundamental challenge in, in, in being able to estimate the number of species of bacteria. Uh, and I feel like in some sense, people have given up on the idea of species for bacteria because it's just so hard to define. Um, if we go by morphology, there are uh, two, two sets of bacteria which we may sort of say, okay, they're so different, they look so different, they behave so differently but their genomes may actually be quite similar to each other and the other way around, right? There are in some cases bacteria that have um, very, uh, very different genomes, but they behave similarly, right? And so this, this problem arises partly because bacteria are also able to easily swap key pieces of their genomes um, called horizontal gene transfer. Uh, so for example, you've heard of antibiotic resistance. That's something that's a major problem across the world and it spreads very rapidly um, even in hospitals. So uh, vancomycin resistance is a classic example of antibiotic resistance that is carried on small plasmids, right? Which are small extra chromosomal genetic elements and they can be easily exchanged by bacteria. And that means that if I'm now starting to define a bacterial species based on, is it resistance to a set of antibacterial uh, uh, agents or not? Um, I am in a bit, of a bit of a spot because there are many different sort of classical species, which may all be resistant to the same set of antibiotics. So I would say that it's hard to give an estimate of the number of bacterial species simply because we don't know what we should call a species uh, in, in terms of for bacteria. What we do know is there are millions of them, of types of bacteria around. Um, so if we decide that, okay, fine, we're going to say that, you know, 3% of a difference in, in the total genome in is, is we're going to say that it's okay for us to call type A versus types there. Uh, so, so I, I, mean, I think, yeah, there, 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 there are a lot of them. The numbers are overwhelming of bacteria themselves and the, the, the diversity of bacteria is overwhelming. And uh, I mean, I, I like bacteria and I love bacteria, but viruses and protists are also super rich, super diverse groups that we really don't understand. Every, every year there are new entire clades of viruses that are discovered, right? Um, and so it's just incredible how little we know about the microbial world, but how hopefully the gen genomic methods are now going to make that easier, make it possible for us to understand more about this world. Um, the second question you had was um, how, you know, what is special about, about the tuberculosis bacterium and why has it evaded, you know, our best methods and our best, um, uh, vaccines and so on for, for so long. Um, I will first, may I have a disclaimer saying that I'm not an expert on, on TB. And so I, I understand relatively little about this bacterium, but I, but I think one of the reasons why it is escaping for so long is, is it's very slow growing, right? So it takes a long time to be detected. It takes a long time to start showing clear signatures of a, a major infection. And so for a long time, people can harbor it in their bodies and be able to infect others without knowing that they are actually infectious, right? It's a slow growing bacterium. It doesn't sort of do much. It's, it hides really well from our body's immune system as well. Um, and, and so I feel like that's at least part of the reason why it is difficult. And TB, many strains of TB that we see now are also antibiotic resistance, so which means that we keep needing more antibiotics and new antibiotics to be able to treat the same pathogen that we were able to treat a few years ago. And this is again, because of this problem of being able to swap plasmids and antibiotic resistance genes very easily and very rapidly across bacteria. Um, and so it's clear that there are many strains of TB that are, uh, that are going around right now, which are uh, resistant to many, many drugs. And that again becomes a problem. So, so there are, and I mean, I, a TB biologist would really sort of be able to add a lot more uh, to this to this question, which I think has a lot of nuance. Um, I I feel like this is what I'm comfortable saying at the moment. Uh, over to Dr. Vinay. Vinay yeah. has some point, or would like yeah, to yeah. have some questions? 
yeah thank you deepa for such a nice informative lectures and uh, it is really appreciable for all of us ki you are here with all mm-hmm. with here so i have very basic question and uh, question is that uh, ki what type of the bacteria we can use at a individual level in our kitchen garden this is a basic question and it mm-hmm. will be very informative for all. the second question is that you know very well at this moment all over the world lot of the research is going pay the attention towards the plastic digesting bacteria mm-hmm. so you know they till today the successful story of those bacteria is very little bit mm-hmm. you can say limited so mm-hmm. do you know ki in near future we can find out some strain which can digest the plastic and we can go ahead with the clean environment mm-hmm. yeah go ahead dipa yeah so unfortunately i feel like i don't have very positive news uh, in both for both your questions um the first one of course in our kitchen garden we know that um you can compost at home for example right uh, whatever organic uh, material that you're using in your kitchen scraps vegetable peels all of that can easily be directly composted if you have a small pot of soil even or if you have worms that help you digest um or degrade the compost but um i at least don't know of one specific bacterium that is going to do the job for you right for obturing and i think that's partly because all of this organic matter is very complex right so there are lots of proteins that need to be degraded there are lots of carbohydrates there are lots of you know this fiber um and so to expect one poor bacterium to do the whole job is a bit asking too much i think and so what we do know of course is there are consortia of bacteria so there are you know multiple species of bacteria or multiple types of bacteria which can together form biofilms or together uh, allow the degradation of um, of different kinds of uh, waste materials and this is true for plastic degradation as well uh, people have been uh, studying this for quite some time now and people have found some groups of bacteria or fungi and bacteria which can work together like one produces one metabolite the other one degrades that you know or they help each other survive better um in in a a uh, degradation kind of environment but it is still a challenge and i think part of the reason again this is something that i i am not an expert on but uh, i think part of the challenge is scaling up to um, to deal with the massive loads that we have generated in terms of plastic right um and that that becomes very hard to manage on an industrial scale because you know there are tons and tons and tons of plastic that we generate every day in you know every house almost will not tons in every house but every locality has tons generated and so to really be able to use these microbial consortia in a scaling up scalable fashion to be able to effectively reduce all of this pollution that we've created i i think it's a bit of a difficult job i think there are two reasons why i think it's difficult one is that um the consortia means that there are associations between the different partners that have to be maintained right and if you change the balance of that consortium so that one partner is dominant or one partner is lost then that becomes a problem because then the whole product is not going to work and maintaining these relationships in in um sort of even laboratory conditions is is not trivial uh so to maintain it in a big reactor where you're going to have uh you know large volumes of waste being degraded is is problematic and second thing of course is things evolve you know uh and so that means that um there may be unwanted selection pressures that we are generating when we try and make do these kinds of processes and the bacteria are going to just keep evolving and that that means that you have to keep reseeding with your original stock which was doing the job that you expected it to do and so because evolution is very hard to stop um it's it's, it's also a challenge and again you know somebody who works in this really would be able to give i think a much much better and much nuanced answer but this this is so, my view yeah one one little question more dr deepa for you so how can climate change influence the diversity and the potential roles of the bacteria in term of the mankind in after 50 years what the prediction mm. what what mm. is the prediction so um there are some predictions after 50 years i think is a bit hard because that's a long term uh, long term change but there have been experiments which will have shown that if you increase the amount of co2 that is given in some ecosystems that really changes or, or temperature that really changes the the communities of bacteria and other microbes that you find in soil for example or in water if you change the ph it dramatically changes uh, what happens uh, to the community 
And so this is something people are actually microbiologists are very concerned about that as climate changes, not only do, do our animals and plants of course get affected, but also the ability of the ecosystem, which includes these microbes to support the animals and plants is also changing. So as temperatures increase, uh, you must have heard that corals are bleaching in the oceans, for instance, right? And the corals are uh, a symbiosis between an alga and, um, and a zooplankton, right? And so it, those are not bacteria, but you know, similar kinds of mutualisms are, are everywhere. And, and all of those are threatened. And it, I guess the only prediction is that it's not good. It's not going to be good. Um, yeah. But beyond that, I think making very specific predictions. All right, exactly uh, Deepa. So I have one question from. Sorry, there is some disturbance. Yeah, yeah. I think your mic is. A bit... Yeah. So here is a question from uh, Sujada Deshpande, uh, one of our participants. And uh, Dr. Sujada is asking, viruses are not part of the tree of life. However, they do evolve and do viruses have phylogeny of their own? And is it possible to join their phylogeny with the tree of life? Mm -hmm. What is your take on this? That's an excellent question. I haven't actually thought about this much. Um, so yeah, so, so people have tried to make phylogenies of viruses, of course. And um, the challenge is even higher there because viruses mutate much faster. Typically, viral mutation rates are much, much higher than orders of magnitude higher than what we see for bacteria. And that makes constructing a phylogeny that is stable a little bit more difficult. Um, it's hard to place viruses in the bigger tree of life because um, as far as I know, there is very little similarity between any, any other um, genome and viral genomes. So I guess, I don't know. I think it's very hard. Uh, but that's an excellent point. I'm going to follow up on that, and I, and I hope to have an answer. If if Dr. Surata wants to email me later, I can I can try and suggest something a bit more useful than what I've just said. Okay, so I think we are already time, and uh, over to Dr. Paramjit Singh. So you can uh, give some concluding remarks. Oh, we can't hear you, Dr. Banjit. You're muted. Uh, Dr. Deepa, mm, thanks for such a lovely interactive session. We had a first, as uh, Felix was saying, uh, we always, in this country, we always uh, consider women. Oh, you're muted again. Sorry, we can't hear you. Uh, in our country, women are always already empowered, I feel, I, at least in our mythology, our ethics, and our social uh, fabric. Uh, if there is any puja in northeast and eastern part, I think Devi's puja, it starts with Saraswati puja in January, February, and it continues. And you have been like, uh, like a, you are bearing torch of knowledge for all of us. And you are bearer of this. And starting this session today, it's wonderful for me also. And I hope all participants, all students, uh, we have have benefited from your talk, and we will. I hope uh, you will make a more uh, interactive group in future. Your questions asked by some uh, students and others, you have very nicely attended to them, and uh, wish you all the best for your future. I hope you will continue with these questions and find more questions and more answers in the future. Absolutely. Thank you very uh, much. I thank again um, Felix and uh, Inyas and uh, our uh, Vice Chancellor, sir, to be patient and listening to you and uh, this session very, very keenly and uh, hope to have much, much useful interactions in future also. With these few words, I say thank you. And, thank you. Uh, thank you again. Thank you. Again. So that concludes uh, today's session. Next is Dr. Manjari Jain from Aisar Mohali. Uh, Dr. Manjari is going to speak about Indian songbirds at 3.30 p.m. today. So please join back at 3.30 p.m. today. And our forthcoming talks are Dr. Martin Zimmer from ZMT Germany, speaking on mangroves at 11 a.m. tomorrow, followed by Guru Raja KV on Fox at 3.30 p.m. tomorrow. So please join back at 3.10 p.m. today after lunch. So see you again.
Goodbye all.